Namaste. So I thought I would combine the insights to chapters eight and nine because they're both kind of on the same subject, which is the incarnations, the avatars, when the goddess descends either to the heavenly world or to the earthly world. And her different incarnations, both in combination and cooperation with Narayana, and also singly by herself. So this is very interesting if you're a student of the Puranas, because she mentions in chapter 8 many of the famous incarnations of Vishnu. They're generally known as the Dashavatars, the ten avatars. And in each one, she descends either as a separate form, and they combine and have pastimes together, or she is his internal state of being. And so this is the first thing that these two chapters clarify, is her state of being and relationship with Narayana, and also clarifies the nature of Narayana as Brahman. And then the other thing that's extraordinary about these two chapters is the amazing blessings that one gets from worshiping these different incarnations with the appropriate hymns. So let's take up one topic at a time. In the first one, in the beginning of chapter 8, she clarifies her relationship with Narayana. Take a look at these verses. Brahman is Narayan, the single, void, pure and flawless one. Antaranga, interior, devoid of any disturbance, undefinable, without vibration, matchless, unqualified, integral, undifferentiated and changeless. All things contained in this world that are cognized, mentioned in the scriptures or inferred, that is, all that can be apprehended directly or indirectly through the three instruments of knowledge, whether of a positive or a negative nature, whether movable or immovable, subtle or gross, sentient or insentient, all these consist of Brahman or Narayan, second to none. So Narayan is Brahman. We've been over this explanation many times in the context of the Lalita Sahasranama. I mean, Lalita Sahasranama, many of the names that are given to the goddess reference the fact that she is the Saguna Brahman and Shiva is the Nirguna Brahman, the original Brahman, one without a second. Uh, like she describes here, without qualities, without boundaries, without vibration, change, time, space, or any of that, then what is Brahman? Brahman is unlimited self-awareness, self with a capital S, awareness of awareness. And she is his egoity. Remember, back to the beginning, egoity is the real self, as opposed to egotism, which is the false self, uh, just an abstraction, not a reality. But she is his ego, his awareness of himself. So some people say, why would you want to go into Brahman? because there's nothing going on, there's no qualities, no activities, it's just, you know, there's nothing, right? <laughs> no. She mentions earlier that he is composed of, of consciousness, bliss, and knowledge, non-dual knowledge. So this is so wonderful. I mean, if you've done any amount of meditation, especially with the help of entheogens, <laughs> you have probably had an experience of Brahman. 
even though you may have not recognized it or you may have not accepted it or maybe you even forgot about it later on or you didn't understand it, it can be there. It's actually always there within us because all four states of consciousness, uh, waking consciousness, jagrat, svapna or dream consciousness, sushupti, deep sleep, and turiya, the fourth, the transcendental consciousness. Uh, this is the consciousness of Brahman. And they're always present in us. The thing is, most of the time, our attention is projected outward through the senses, and so we miss it. But when we turn within and bring the chakras up to their high energy states, then we can penetrate the mind, the Agnya Chakra, and raise the Kundalini up to the Sahasrara, and then the ecstatic union of Goddess Shiva and Shakti or Lakshmi and Narayan can take place. And this is the actual goal of Tantra. Even though sometimes sexual outward, you know, external sexual activities uh, are used in this puja, actually the puja is meant to awaken the goddess and allow her to take her natural course and move up to the Sahasrara and unite with the God. Uh -huh. So this is the aim of all yoga. This is self-realization, and this is what it's all about. So next she says, Brahman is bliss without avidya, nescience, pure, absolute, and concentrated consciousness consisting of both the existent reality and its state of existence, the divine and ultimate goal of the spiritual path. Brahman differentiates itself in two ways, both as the possessor of Shakti and as the Shakti herself. That absolute Brahman, as the possessor of Shakti, is manifest as Narayan, the I entity, the existent principle. As Shakti, Brahman is Narayani, who is myself, the I-hood of Narayan, representing his bhava, state of existence. There is no place where he exists without me. There is no place that contains me without containing him. We, the source of all, are sometimes described singly and sometimes dually in the scriptures that have reached, as it were, the other side of the ocean of the cosmic principles. What are the cosmic principles? The tattvas. Remember the tattvas? So according to Sankhya philosophy, there can be 22 or 24 or 27 or 32 <laughs> different tattvas meaning the ingredients, the basic ingredients of the universal creation. But in all of them, the first two are Bhagavan, God, and Shakti, his energy. The I principle and his egoity, his identity, who he is, how he knows himself. See, his beingness, his, the existent principle, and his state of being. Now, what's the difference between being and state? Huh? Well, what is a state, first of all? A state is a quality of something or someone among others. Huh? Like we talked about the states of consciousness, jagrat, shushupti, Turiya, and so on. These are different states of consciousness. Consciousness is always there, but it has different states. And, and similarly, Brahman is sometimes unary, one, and sometimes dual. That is Shiva and Shakti, or Lakshmi Narayan. So this Brahman is the actual existence but its state of existence can be monistic or dualistic, 
according to his will. <laughs> so Shakti represents that will. Shakti represents the evolution and maintenance and devolution of the universe, the activities that come out of Narayana as an automatic function of his existence. Now, this is going <laughs> way longer than I thought it was going to go. Uh, so I'm going to move on. You can go back and review this, right? You know how to study, right? You did our course on study matrix learning, right? <clears throat> anyway, don't be as stupid. <laughs> Use these videos because why? She describes in the ninth chapter the extraordinary blessings of worshiping her. So I'm just going to go through and read these real quick because they speak pretty much for themselves. Worshipped by the gods, I, in that form of Mahisha Mardini, instantly slew the demon Mahisha. Then the Mahishasura Mardini Stotram, the laudatory hymn addressed to the slayer of Mahisha, beginning with the words Devya Yaya, which fulfills every wish, was revealed to all the gods, including Indra and the sages. O king of the gods, Brahmanas skilled in the Vedas relate in detail Mahisha Mardini's origin, prowess in battle, and the eulogies addressed to her. And he who praises, meditates upon, or even bows down to so powerful a goddess is rewarded with everlasting supremacy. The inscrutable power of the mysterious goddess Mahakali, who belongs to Vishnu, is such that when gratified by praise, she makes the devotee master of the movable and immovable beings in this world. The Brahmavadins who expound the Vedas hold that constant reminders of this goddess's origin and exploits, accompanied by chanting of her praises, has beneficial effect on all living beings. Whereafter, I killed those two demons, Shumba and Nishumba. Then to all the gods led by Agni, the fire god, was revealed the very beautiful hymn praising me, known as the eulogy of Narayani, Devi Mahatmyam, opening with the words, Devi Prapanarti Hare Prasida. O Lord of all gods, when worshipped with devotion, I, the goddess Kaushiki, fulfiller of many desires, bestow omniscience on the devotee. The ancient Brahmanas who are conversant with the Vedas and auxiliary sciences pay homage to me in three ways, by reciting accounts of my origin, exploits in battle, and by extolling me. O Chakra, he who praises, meditates on, worships and salutes Shakampari, obtains quick and permanent relief of his desires for food and drink. In praise of her, the holy hymn Namo Devya, Devi Suktam, ensures the fulfillment of wishes and was revealed to all the gods headed by Brahma. Here in this world, he who daily worships me, who am this goddess, by reciting these laudatory hymns, overcomes all difficulties and attains great prosperity. He who has learned about my avatars from a brahmana, after dispelling all illusion, obtains true knowledge, gains prosperity, and succeeds in destroying all effects of evil, and, assisted by me, achieves good fortune and fame. And then, of course, she saves the best for last. In the Absolute and its natural state manifested in the pure sheath, the inseparable existence of myself and Vishnu must also be viewed in the same light. Discerning that in my generally accepted appearance, my nature consists of a combination of various natures and worshiping me in diverse ways, the aspirant escapes the misery caused by his deeds and attains madbhavam, my own state of existence. Wow! 
This is huge. What is her state of existence? Huh? Well, have you ever seen pictures of Lakshmi Narayan? Take a look. Here they are, resting on the milk ocean, on the snake form of Sankarshan. And she's massaging his feet while he is apparently asleep in Yoga Nidra. And Yoga Nidra is also a form of the goddess Mahakali, who represents the mode of Tamoguna. So, is he really asleep? Remember the description of Narayan as Brahman? So he's not really asleep exactly. He's, his consciousness is directed within and he is contemplating himself as Brahman. So this is the wonder of the creation. This is why the creation is made. So that the Lord, Brahman, can perceive and contemplate himself from the point of view of some other being. Because in actuality, no other being exists. Of course, he is aware of himself at all times. But to experience the creation and to become Narayan and the various Vishnu forms and so on and the incarnations and interact with various different levels of beings gives him a much clearer, much deeper sense of who he is and what he is. And this is why, this is the secret of the creation. So here he is as Narayan and his consciousness is folded back on itself and he is contemplating his nature as Brahman. And she is holding his feet. She is actually massaging his feet and keeping him comfortable. So what does this mean? This is her nature. This is who she is. She is the servant of Brahman who is the creation and who uh, serves him by giving him this world from which he can look back on himself and know himself. This is a pretty cool thing, right? So this is why we exist. And this is why we are as important, we are as vital, we are as necessary as anything in the world. Because we give him this opportunity to see himself through our eyes. And this is really the purpose of the creation. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum.